All right, we still got folks trickling in a little bit, but we'll get going. Uh, they'll, they'll get here eventually and, and catch up. Uh, today, I'm going to want to talk through uh, some tips and tricks I've learned over the years. Uh, been doing open source full time as my job for about nine years now. Worked on a number of different projects. Hopefully, help you get more involved, help you be a good open source contributor, and, and maybe help you get some of your own code out there someday, too. Uh, I'm Charles Nutter. Uh, I've been working for the past nine years on JRuby uh, and other related projects. Uh, first off at uh, Sun Microsystems for about three years and then at Engine Yard for a few years. Uh, and then since 2012, I've been at Red Hat as part of the Polyglot R&D group. We do a lot of interesting little projects. I'll talk about some of those later. Uh, so who are you? Uh, there's obviously developers here. It's a Java conference. You probably do some stuff with Java. Uh, you're in the Java world, so you're obviously all using open source in some capacity, even if you're just using OpenJDK itself. But probably a large portion of the stack you use and a lot of the libraries you use are also open source. Uh, so maybe some of your contributors. How many people have ever filed a bug on, on an open source project? Okay, it's not everybody, surprisingly, but, the, but most of the room. That one's, that one's pretty good. Uh, how about folks that have actually sent in a patch to an open source project? Yeah, the hands start to, to, to get less. Uh, anybody that's open sourced a project of their own or run a project? Okay, yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Uh, this is uh, a little higher than some other groups that I've seen. Uh, some other types, of, some other technology worlds have higher or lower numbers. Ruby folks are all working in open source. Uh, Microsoft and .NET folks a little bit less, although they're starting to get there. So, first of all, we'll talk a little bit about like what, what it is that is actually makes up open source. Uh, there's several definitions out there, uh, and generally, what we talk, what we're talking about here is open source software, of course. Uh, if you go to the Wikipedia definition, you'll see uh, things like study, change, distribute software for, to anyone for any purpose. Uh, basically, the source is out there and it's available. You can use it, you can modify it, and you can pass it on to other people. Uh, but there's also another term that's used a lot, free software, uh, which distinguishing between the two, the people that have come up with these individual terms are very adamant that they're not the same thing. But if you look at the free software definition on Wikipedia, it's study, change, distribute the software uh, to anyone. Again, largely the same definitions, uh, but also includes running the software for any purpose. So being able to use the software as well as having access to the source, being able to redistribute it. And so what we're generally going to be talking about here is the combined world, free and open source software, FOSS, uh, as it's often abbreviated. Uh, and again, the Wikipedia definition kind of combines these two worlds. Uh, but the key points here are that it's, it's software that's classified as both free software and open source. So it's freely licensed, which means that the license doesn't put restrictions on how you pass on the source, how you use the project. Uh, you can use, copy, study, and change the software in any ways you want. Uh, the source code is openly shared. It's not something you have to go find. It's part of the project. It's, it's generally distributed with the, uh, the binaries of the project or available online somewhere. Uh, and the bottom line here for this talk is that people are encouraged to voluntarily help improve the design of the software. So open source has to have a large pool of people voluntarily contributing time, contributing effort, and working on open source all the time. Now, so some of the benefits of, of open source in general, uh, a lot of people say that you have cost savings. Uh, so you don't need to pot, buy a piece of software. You can just go out and download a tarball, uh, download some source, and that sometimes can be a benefit. Uh, but you're also on your own. There's going to be things that you're going to have to figure out on your own. You're not going to have uh, often a nice installer. You're not going to have some, the same support channels. So sometimes the cost benefits are, are softened a little bit. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Uh, the visibility into the project. Obviously, you can see what you're running. You can look into the code. You can debug into the code. Uh, all of these things are benefits. And especially with OpenJDK now, if you need to step through into Java code, it's almost always available. You can walk right into it and see what's actually happening under the covers. Uh, more importantly, you're empowered to make changes. If the organization that distributes some piece of software goes away, you can still make changes to it. You can improve the software on your own. Again, voluntarily improving the software for the good of everybody. And uh, commercial support is optional. You buy a commercial off the, off the shelf 
product, you have to pay someone. You're paying someone to give you that software and to give you guarantees about it. Uh, with open source, you can kind of try things out, play with it a little bit more easily, get into it at your own pace. You don't necessarily have to buy into something from day zero. And probably the most exciting thing about this is that open source really is winning. Uh, over the past 10, 20 years, more and more developers have started to put source out in public and open. Uh, more and more projects have begin, been opening up. Uh, and the, the ecosystem has grown to be the large pool of software. It's no longer mostly closed source out there. It's mostly open source that's being used in the real world. Uh, and some obvious wins, well, I'm, I, I work for Red Hat, so I have to put Red Hat up here, uh, a company that's based entirely off of supporting open source. Uh, you pay for uh, subscription support from, open, from uh, Red Hat, you get support for everything that's in the Red Hat stack or everything in the JBoss Wildfly stack. Uh, and it's, it's, it's actually worked out as a very successful model, probably the most successful company based entirely off of open source support. Of course, there's lots of other projects out there. Uh, just, this is a, 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 a section of the page from openhub.net, which monitors uh, open source projects, commits over time, contributors over time, basically the health of the project. Um, you can see a couple of the browsers across the top there, Firefox, uh, Chrome, and so on. Uh, the Linux kernel itself is in here. Languages, PHP is in there, MySQL, open source database. You can see kind of that there's lots of folks out there. You can see the big projects that are in open source. Uh, and speaking specifically about browsers, you can see the, the steady trend of Internet Explorer, a closed source and rather cumbersome and problematic software in the past, slowly going down and being overtaken by all the open source options. Uh, we have our Firefox, we have Chrome as the top two, as the top ones, Chrome most recently really overtaking this. Uh, and you can see this is uh, contributors per month for Chrome over time, uh, from 2009 until the present. Steady increase of people actually contributing to the project. Now this isn't necessarily that Google is pouring more resources into it, it's that people like you are getting involved and helping to continue make Chrome a better project. Uh, and this extends to larger areas. This is a, a graph of uh, supercomputing platforms over the years. Linux, basically unheard of before 1999, has now massively taken over this area. So this isn't just for serv web servers, this isn't just for little applications, this is doing real work and, and the bulk of the real work out there in the super supercomputing world. Um, of course, web servers, uh, a lot of folks here are doing web development. Linux is still way out there as the, the top deployment platform. Uh, Windows is maybe a quarter of the platform out there based on most measurements. Uh, and then because of this fact, the fact that open source is winning, even companies that were traditionally hostile to open source have now started to turn around. Uh, Microsoft recently open sourcing a whole bunch of the .NET platform and putting it right on GitHub with everything else that's out there. Uh, now fitting into the open source world, realizing that this is how they're going to get people involved, this is how they're going to have their software continue to be successful, and that there's a lot of people who just won't use it unless it is actually open source and out there available. So, this talk is going to focus on the fact that with all this cool stuff going on, the successes that we've had over the years, open source still really needs folks like you to get involved. Everybody in here should be doing something to help their favorite open source project. I'm going to try and walk you through a few ways that you can contribute, things that you can do to, to help projects move forward and be successful. All right, so getting started. For folks that have not done a whole lot of open source work before, have not been involved in projects, uh, first off, why would you want to do this? You're going to take some time. Why would you voluntarily try to contribute your time and effort to a project? Uh, well, it's obviously a huge learning opportunity. Depending on what you're going to work on, you're going to learn more than you ever did at university about software, about putting these systems together, about language design, about databases and optimization. Uh, this is the biggest thing I've gotten out of it. It's been an incredible learning opportunity for me to work on open source for nine years. It's a huge resume builder. Uh, for anybody out there that is, you know, wants to keep their resume up to date, wants to be able to look for new, new positions, having your contrib contributions out there in the public in open source projects is a great way to get folks interested. Uh, I get emails from recruiters all the time that know nothing about me except that I've got a lot of contributions on GitHub. And they're, they've got opportunities and they want to hire me in, just based on that. They don't see a resume, they don't know about JRuby, they ask me to, to work on things that are totally unrelated, but they can see that I've got this track record of uh, contributions out there. 
Uh, there's community and social aspects. You're going to get to know a lot more folks around the world. You're going to have opportunities to go and meet them, opportunities to go and speak, invitations to conferences if you get deeper into projects like I do sometimes. Uh, there's a lot of things that come out of this that are not just tangible, like technical benefits. Being able to meet new people, get out there, get into the community a bit more. And it's actually a lot of fun. Uh, I wouldn't have done this work for nine years if it wasn't great to meet new people, meet new challenges, and learn more about the technologies I'm trying to work on. Uh, so hopefully these are some re these reasons that will convince you that this is worthwhile. So now getting down to the actual process here. Finding a project that you want to contribute to. All right? So it, 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 probably the easiest way is to think about some tools or libraries that you use, something you depend on right now. Uh, maybe there's quirks in a library, quirks in a database library that you have issues with, uh, quirks in some web framework, or features that you think are missing. Something that you use that you want to improve for yourself and for the benefit of others. Uh, it may be a technology that you're simply interested in. Maybe you are a, a Java enterprise developer by day, but you really would like to do 3D graphics or games. There's libraries out there, frameworks out there that you can get involved in. Stuff that you can start playing with on your own time uh, and be a, an open source contributor at the same time as well. Uh, it might be languages or frameworks or databases that you want to learn more about. In my case, I came to JRuby because I was interested in Ruby. I was a Java enterprise architect, uh, went to RubyConf, was really enamored with the language and excited about getting involved. And so then that turned into nine years of JRuby work. Uh, and it may be a project that you simply want to help, something that you see out there that needs resources, needs folks to start contributing. Uh, so my story, uh, the first open source project I actually worked on was called LightStep. Anybody here familiar with LightStep? Oh, there are a few. Awesome. So uh, in like 1998, I came into the project and wanted to, to try and contribute to it. And b like based on those same principles of how to find a project to contribute to, it was a project I was using myself. It's, it's a, a, an Explorer uh, desktop replacement for Windows. Replaces the taskbar, replaces the desktop, and then gives you your own widgets that you can plug in. Uh, pretty cool little thing. Basically skins the entire desktop in a, t in a totally new next steppy sort of way. So it was a project I was using myself, um, and it was open source. Uh, it, I was familiar with the languages. It was written in C, some C++, uh, Win32 APIs, which I'd done some, some development in. Uh, development had basically ground to a halt. There was very little work going on, and the code base had started to kind of bit rot. It was getting old and crufty. Uh, and it was a large, monolithic piece of crap that was just sort of balled together. My way of getting involved was that I went in there, I started pulling the pieces apart, I started cleaning up the code base a little bit, breaking up this monolithic code base into more source files, more sub-modules, uh, and lo and behold, within about a, a month of doing that, I became the lead of the project, suddenly. And so I led Let's LightStep for about a year, we made a lot of interesting improvements into it, and uh, I believe it's still out there going as a project today. So the bulk of my open source career, though, has been in working on JRuby. Uh, there's a JRuby talk later today at 2. Uh, JRuby is an implementation of Ruby, runs on top of the JVM, written mostly in Java, although more and more we're using Ruby itself to implement it. And again, development had kind of slowed down when I got involved in 2005. Uh, there were lots of different tasks that were still out there. It needed to be updated for compatibility. Performance wasn't where it should be for a JVM language. Lots of little things that could be done. Uh, and so while I was sitting at RubyConf in 2004, learning this new language and excited about it and, and knowing that I was just a Java enterprise architect, uh, I looked for a project out there called JRuby, found out that an old friend of mine was actually the sole contributor. Uh, this last line on the bottom here is really the saddest thing. This is the saddest part of open source. Eventually, everyone's in this position. I am really the only JRuby developer at this point, this lonely world that he lived in. Uh, so I started to get involved, and over time my contributions ramped up, I started to do more and more work on it, then Sun Microsystems got interested, hired us on to work on it full time, uh, other Ruby companies like Ringe and Yard continued to start adopting JRuby, and more and more work went into this project. Lots of exciting stuff and lots of tasks that came out of it. So the second step for getting involved here is probably getting into and in, in, in meeting the community, figuring out who these people are, what their needs are. Uh, so you can get on mailing lists and forums, obviously. Most projects are of, of a, a, a medium size, medium or larger, will have a mailing list or a forum of some kind. 
Uh, a lot of them starting to use things like Gitter or Slack as well. Uh, chat services like IRC, chat services like Gitter, great way to get involved. Find out if there's a place where the developers congregate. You can go out, talk to them. You can just lurk and see what's going on, see what they're discussing on the channel. Uh, figure out what sort of needs there are out there. Tell them you're interested in helping. Maybe they'll have something you can do. Uh, question and answer sites are a great way to look at this. Stack Overflow, Quora, go out there and see what problems people are having with the software. Those might be things that you know how to do, things that you can fix. Uh, or they might be things you, that sound interesting for you to research. You can answer questions, you can go and help the community uh, improve the pool of knowledge. Uh, and then to, to a lesser extent, social sites like, uh, like LinkedIn, Facebook, even Twitter, you can, if that project has a Twitter feed, you might be able to follow that. Uh, not as much the, uh, getting involved in the community, but finding out what the pulse is, how things are going. So once you get involved in the community, you know the project that you want to work on, uh, the next step would be to figuring, uh, figuring out what exactly you can contribute to the project. So it doesn't have to be code. It doesn't even have to be code initially. It doesn't have to be bugs. Simple things like just help field questions. Uh, get on the mailing list and answer questions for other users that are having trouble. Uh, pass on some of your knowledge of the project to new users. Improve the documentation that's out there. Work on the wiki pages. Uh, submit documentation patches. Uh, help clean up the, the overall pool of documentation for the project. Uh, you can start presenting about it. And there's no reason that you have to be involved in the project to say, here's what I use it for. Here's what I'm doing with this project in the real world. Uh, start doing presentations, get more people involved, and get them to know that the project is out there. These are all great non-code ways to get involved in an open source project and help it move forward. And every one of these, we wish we had dozens more people that were doing these. Any open source project needs folks that can do these. And then, of course, you can get more into the technical side. You can file bugs, you can start submitting fixes, and so on. Um, so a quick note on folks, for the folks that haven't filed a bug or have filed bugs and might need some tips, uh, good bug reporting for an open source, what we want to see in a bug report. Uh, so first of all, clearly stating the expectations versus what actually happened, versus reality. Uh, we get so many bug reports that will come in and say, this is broken, and they don't tell us what they actually expect to happen. Or they'll say, here's JRuby's output, and we're just supposed to guess at what piece of that might be wrong. Clearly state both what you expected to happen and what the reality was. Uh, provide some simple code and some, or some steps to reproduce. And this is not just showing a command line session. Uh, give us a script that we can run. Uh, make a little temporary GitHub database or a, a temporary GitHub project that we can just go in and run a simple command and get it to go. Anything you can do to make it easier for us to run it in one or two steps, better, uh, much more likely we're going to get to the, the heart of it. Um, always try and volunteer relevant environment details. Every time that we have to go back and forth and ask you, okay, so what platform are you on? All right, what Java version are you on? Uh, what version of the project are you on? Often people just omit that. Uh, always try to volunteer at least the basics of your environment. Uh, and then be responsive. As your bug is updated, as comments come in, be right on the ball and respond quickly. Uh, there's so, many, so much backlog of, op of, of issues in open source projects. If you're not there responding on a regular basis, it's probably going to get pushed to the bottom of the queue. You may never get resolved. Uh, if you respond quickly, much more likely that it's going to stay at the top of that, that queue. Uh, it's going to get the attention it needs. OK, so is this a good bug report or a bad bug report? I, we, get, we get lots and lots of these. It's, it's improved over the years as people get more into to doing bug reports. But this is literally the entire bug report. Uh, a null pointer exception in some line of code. Who knows what they were running? At least we do have a JRuby version. We don't know what platform they were on. Uh, we know what version of Java. Uh, but other than that, it, we're left to kind of guess at what's happened here. We can go in and say, OK, well, there's this that could cause a null pointer or that, uh, but not a very good bug report. So don't do things like that, obviously. Um, here's a better example, more recently. Uh, this is a, a very simple, very short and sweet bug report. It has in the description a bug, uh, the description of the bug, it says what's, what's wrong, what it's doing that he doesn't expect. It has a very simple script that we can just copy and paste out and run to see the results. And then at the bottom, clearly stating what happened versus what was expected to happen. A little bit more complicated here. Uh, this one actually reads like a blog post. 
Uh, it starts out describing some background on SSL, on TLS issues, uh, how, to how different platforms and different runtimes figure out SSL versions, and then it goes into the actual examples of what JRuby does versus regular Ruby and what the, what the problem is, what's expected and what's not working. All right, so we can file bugs, uh, but we can even go deeper than that. We can start to dig into the next level. Uh, and this one is, is a huge way to help uh, an open source project. Once you get to know a project, you know how to run its tests, you know how to build it, go in there and start looking at the bug reports that are in their backlog. JRuby right now has well over 700 open bugs. I guarantee you that there's not 700 bugs in JRuby right now, or at least not those, those 700 are not all still valid. Probably a tiny percentage of those, like 100 of those, might actually be valid bugs at this point. Go in there, see if they're still valid, uh, t take the place of the core developers on the project. Ask the questions about the environment. Ask for reproductions. See if you can help clean up that backlog a little bit. Um, you can help guide other bug reporters. If you see people submitting bug reports that are missing important information, tell them. Tell them that they need to include some extra information, some environment details, or a nice script. Uh, you can watch and see how other bugs are fixed. Uh, as the process goes forward, especially on a, 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 a platform like GitHub, you'll see the patches come in, you'll see the discussion, you'll see the changes, and it's a great way to learn how things fit together in that library or in that project. Uh, so pay attention to what's actually happening with other bugs. Uh, and then, of course, you can start to actually go into the point where you attempt your own fix. Rather than just filing bugs and cleaning up the bug reports, you can get in there and make some changes. So the next section here, we'll talk about actually the process of getting involved and contributing a fix to a project. So the main reason that folks don't actually contribute fixes, or co contribute code at least, to open source projects is fear. Uh, a number of different things. Most people can identify with at least one of these. I'm not good enough to make this change to a project. Probably the number one thing. Uh, not confident enough to make changes to some piece of technology. Uh, I don't know the best solution. These people obviously know the project better than I do. What am I going to be able to do to help out? Uh, and again, it's, it's any help that we can get. Someone proposes a, a solution, gets the bug up to the top of the, the attention span, then we can start moving from there. Uh, I'll make things worse. This is certainly possible, but I guarantee you I've done more to make JRuby worse than anyone else that has submitted a patch to it. So I'm gonna be very, very accepting of, of issues. We're gonna work through it, we'll test things, that's why we have tests, uh, and we'll make sure that whatever you submit is not gonna be a problem. Uh, and this is, more recently, people are worried about being mocked or insulted. And there are projects out there that uh, are, shall I say, not very welcoming. Uh, we try to be very open and very friendly and very accepting of all sorts of people, uh, all sorts of, uh, all levels of skill, uh, all backgrounds. Generally, open source is probably the nicest place that you can be working on projects, uh, and it's improving over time. It's, we're starting to see people call out projects that don't do a nice job of managing their community and fitting in. So most of these just don't happen. They're not really issues that you need to worry about, so try to, try to jump past the fear and get involved. So I want to talk a little bit about, about, about the big contributions I've made to JRuby over time uh, and put it in, in terms of fear here. So I've done several rewrites of our interpreter. Uh, I've written multiple versions of our JIT compiler that turns Ruby into JVM bytecode. Uh, I've written some native IO code and some native process management, so making calls down to C uh, from the JVM. Uh, I've rewritten multiple times the entire Ruby to Java integration layer. So key parts, very deep, important parts of JRuby. And the interesting thing is that I had no idea about how to do any of this when I started working on JRuby. I never took a compiler's course. I'd never written a parser. Uh, none of these things. I'd written a little bit of C, like for university courses, and that was about it. But I learned as I went, and I started small with small pieces. Started with little rewrites of existing code. Get to understand it and move forward, and I was able to get past most of the fear factor there. All right. So now bug fix types. 
Uh, obviously, there's, there's changes to behavior. That's the most interesting type for uh, a, a piece of software project. Uh, but you know, there can be bug fixes for performance. You can find algorithms that are uh, inefficient, something that's an O of n cube that you can make an O of n, or you know, m reduce the complexity of some algorithm. Uh, documentation fixes are always welcome. That can be documentation in the code or documentation fixes on a wiki, documentation fixes on uh, the readmes and other files that come along with the project. And there can be quality fixes. We also accept code fixes that just improve the quality of the code base, cleaning up source files, uh, improving, running things like find bugs to, to tidy up likely, poss likely bugs that might be issues with the software. Uh, it doesn't have to be directly behavior or performance. It can just be making it a better source code base. So now you've actually decided what sort of thing you want to contribute to, what sort of fix you want to do. Uh, let's see what we've got here. So you modify your copy of the code. Uh, usually that's going to mean cloning it from GitHub, pulling it down with whatever source control the project uses. Most projects on GitHub now, as, as we all know. Uh, and modify your copy of the code in place. Confirm that it works as you expect. And now there's two very key details here. First of all, make sure that it actually fixes the issue that you're trying to fix. You would be surprised how many patches we get that actually don't do anything to improve the situation at all. They didn't actually run it or they didn't test it or something. Uh, and then beyond that, make sure that it doesn't fail any existing tests. Uh, good projects will have a list of, of instructions or, or an easy command you can run to do some sanity checks or a full test suite. Make sure you've run that before you go ahead and submit your patch. Uh, so, and then also write your own test. If you're fixing something that didn't fail before, it's good to have a test for it in the future. Make sure that it doesn't break again. Uh, and then submit your fix in the open. Use the GitHub pull request if that's what the project prefers. Use a patch sent to a mail list if that's what they prefer. Uh, but make sure that it's in the open, it's in, it's in the public, it makes licensing a lot easier, and it makes discussion and collaboration a lot easier as well. Um, so here's an example of a reasonably good patch for, for JRuby. Uh, notice that it's not changing all lines. It doesn't do reformatting unnecessarily. It maintains documentation, even though it removes some code. Uh, and then, you know, make sure that the documentation is still valid. We'll talk through that with the project. Uh, it includes a test. In this case, it's using Ruby's RSpec uh, behavior-driven testing. Uh, so we've got a nice patch, we've got a nice test, and we can submit it. So a few more tips here. Uh, if you feel like you're having trouble, don't be afraid to ask for help. You can file a bug, see if you can get uh, some of the core developers in there to answer questions. If you're not sure how to fix it, they'll probably give you some guidance. Uh, open source projects just want some hands on, the, on the, the code, working on stuff. We're happy to give you some tips and tricks on where in the source to, to actually look for a fix. Uh, limit your changes to the actual thing that you're fixing. It's always tempting to go out there and fix r related things as you go. Uh, make those separate patches, make them separate issues. It, it makes review process much easier for all, all of us on the, the receiving side. Uh, follow the proximate coding style. And I, most projects will have some sort of standard for the coding style, coding conventions that they use. Uh, but a large enough project, there's, there's bit rot, there's a little uh, coding style creep that happens. Uh, stick to whatever the, the coding style of the files you're working on is, even if they don't seem like they're quite right. Uh, submitting patches that also do reformatting makes reviewing almost impossible. Uh, so try to make your changes smaller uh, and keep it to whatever the style of the code around it looks like. Uh, maintain documentation truths. As I mentioned, if you have documentation that's already in the code, after your changes, confirm that it actually still makes sense. Uh, and add, doc add documentation if you see it's missing. And then be patient responsive. Again, being able to, to go back and forth with the project, make changes to the code, uh, and revise it over time. All right, so we've made some patches. We've made some fixes. They've gotten accepted into our favorite project. Uh, maybe it's time for us to start looking at actually being a contributor, committer to this project. So first of all, I want to say that the commit bit that you get for a project, the ability to commit code directly to it, is, is not a prize that you win. It feels great to get it. And a lot of people, that's their sole goal, is to get a commit bit on some project that they really like. But it, it really is also a responsibility. Uh, and the reason for this is because core contributors to an open source project are developers, they are managers, they are evangelists, they're QA, they're community coordinators, they're all of these things in one. Uh, whether they want to or not. So getting commit to a project means that you're going to be doing a lot more than just writing code. Something to think about and, and when you accept that responsibility. 
So on the JRuby project, what we look for in adding a committer, adding a new contributor, uh, a proven track record of contributions. And this can be over a short period of time if it's someone that we, we really like working with and they're doing great work. Uh, some of our committers have been out there doing patches for a year or more. Uh, and GitHub makes it very easy for people to contribute without having direct commit rights. We do pull requests, we do patches, uh, but we want to see a proven track record over time. Sustained interest. Sometimes people will get interested for just a couple weeks and then they'll disappear. Uh, we wait for a little while just to make sure it's someone who's going to continue contributing to us. We like having committers on the project, but we don't, also don't want a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of inactive contributors that aren't doing work anymore or have lost interest in the project. Uh, we look for domain expertise. We have people that are specifically Maven experts, that are specifically native integration, native call experts, uh, folks that are compiler people. We brought in a compiler expert, PhD guy, to work on our new compiler for JRuby 9000. Anything that you've got that might be a specific domain area, maybe it's documentation, maybe it's writing blog posts, maybe it's writing technical docs for a wiki. All of these things are great areas to get involved in a project and a very quick path to getting in as a core contributor. Uh, and somebody that's, been, that's proven that they're respectful. We don't add committers that are obviously difficult to work with. Someone that is, an, is answering questions, uh, being calm, being respectful, being patient with other, develop, other uh, project users and other project developers, that's what we look for. And that's, that's how you're going to get in. So there's another process to this as well. You might have heard of called the open commit bit. Uh, the idea here is that there, there's a number of projects if you make one contribution, you get in. You're a committer now. Uh, and this is a great way to get into get a, a pool of developers going early on in a project's life cycle. But as the project matures, as JRuby is, we've got folks running stuff at the BBC. We've got folks running stuff at uh, Visa. We need to be a little bit more careful about who we give the keys to the castle to. Great way to start for, for early projects, though. If you spin off your own project and you want to get folks involved in it, you know, you can kind of give that carrot of, of commit bit out a little bit more freely at the beginning. Uh, so a profile of one of our core developers, uh, M. Christian, Christian Meyer, uh, he was a Maven integration expert. He'd been using JRuby to integrate Ruby and Maven uh, for several years, actually. Uh, he was an active user on our mailing lists. He was answering questions about how to do Ruby and Maven and JRuby and Maven together. Uh, like I said, maintaining related libraries and consistently submitting patches to improve JRuby. He, he was the Maven guy. He loved to do this for whatever reason. And we needed this kind of guy in the project. So he became a committer uh, a couple years ago, helped us make a lot of improvements in how we integrate with uh, a typical Java build. So now when, you're, when you are a committer, once you get into a project, there's some tips to actually be a good contributor. Uh, so any non-trivial changes, especially if they're areas where you know there's a more of a domain, domain expert, uh, someone like, like M. Christian, who's Maven guy or whatever, uh, discuss them on a mailing list. Or on, your own, on, the own, on the project you have commit rights to, there's no reason you can't still open pull requests and do your discussions there. Let other project members review it, work with you, and then you can merge it back in. Uh, keep the test green all the time. Uh, it's, it's hard, especially on a large project like JRuby, to keep all the tests green. We have about 40 test suites that run for every, every commit on Travis. Uh, and our overall build on Travis consumes something like six hours of CPU time. Uh, so thanks, thanks for Travis. That's great. Um, I'd rather not be running that on my machine. Uh, but keep the tests green. Every time they go red, it's a matter of hunting down who broke it, figuring out what the problem is, wastes a lot of time on the project. Uh, be respectful of bug and patch submitters. Just like you were before when you first started contributing to an open source project, there's a lot of people that are going to make mistakes. They've got a lot of fear. Try and help them get involved in the project more gently. Uh, and always remain humble. And by humble, I mean treat every bug report as if it was a gift. Someone went out of their way to file this bug. If they didn't file it, the bug would still be there, and you would not know. So treat every bug report as a gift. Don't get angry at bug reports. Love them and hold them close to your heart always. And generally assume that you're wrong. If someone ran into something, either it's a problem in your software or it's a problem in how they learn to use your software. 
oftentimes it's, it's just that they didn't know what the right process was, the right way to use an API. Maybe it's not a bug, but in, it's good to assume that you're wrong or there's something about that could be improved documentation-wise to make it easier for other folks in the future. Uh, and of course, not all bugs are in code. Some of these things are just user experience. If it seems like everyone's tripping over this one API, maybe that API isn't designed very well. It may not be a bug, but it's a usability issue, and so it's something to look at. All right, so going deeper, uh, one of our big sections here, actually getting your own project, your own source out there as an open source project. So why would you want to start a project or spin your project off as open source? Well, there may be a gap in whatever community you're working with. Uh, a library that wraps uh, some database that does a, a really nice new ORM doesn't seem to have any analog that's out there. Uh, a graphics library, then you've created a nice wrapper API around it that makes it easier to use. Some sort of gap that needs to be filled. Something that you've done for yourself or you want to do for the community. Uh, a tool that others might find useful. Maybe it's something that you've used internally, just a little utility library you've written over the years, and as utility libraries grow, we have more and more stuff is in there. Maybe this is something that the community would find useful and could actually help you improve, make it better for you as well. Uh, it may be a pro it, you may need more resources on your project. It may be something that you don't feel like you can continue to maintain this. Throw it out into the world, you know? See if it has legs. See if there's folks that are interested in contributing and picking it up. Uh, my example, I did uh, another pro a little language called Mira. Uh, it's a language that sort of compiles Ruby into Java code directly, statically typed, uh, just sort of a, a Ruby to Java converter rather than a, a runtime. Uh, and I just couldn't maintain it anymore. I didn't have time to do it with JRuby. But put it out there, talk to some of the other folks in the community. Now there's people maintaining it and keeping it going as a project. Uh, maybe just for fun. Uh, like I said, maybe there's graphics libraries or, or game libraries that you want to work with. Uh, this is a great reason to throw your code out there and start working on something in the open. Uh, a lot of folks, when I do this talk, ask, how do you find time to do this? Most folks here are probably not doing open source all day, uh, and, and many of you aren't at companies that are going to allow you to have extra time. So how do you find time to work on open source? Uh, well, you can make it a hobby. Uh, for example, if you're doing uh, Raspberry Pi stuff, maybe there's Raspberry Pi libraries that you can start writing, spinning off as open source, uh, make it sort of a fun thing, a project that you do in your spare time, rather than you know watching TV or uh, drinking beer, which is my hobby. Um, so prefer jobs that support open source work. Maybe you're not in one of those jobs now, but you're probably going to make a change at some point. Ask them. Ask them how they feel about giving you 10% time, 20% time, a day a week, something like that, to work on open source projects. This is important for you and your career, and it's important for the, the software world in general. So I think it's absolutely something you should start requiring out of employers. Let, make sure that they know how important open source is to their world and to yours. Um, explaining career benefits to, for example, your, your partner. Uh, someone at home that wants time out of you. Uh, when you're done with work, they want you to dedicate your time to the family. Well, make sure they understand that it's a resume builder, that it's a learning opportunity. It's something that you want to do. It's something that you're really excited about doing. Uh, and nine times out of ten, that'll get you some extra free time. You can work on stuff in the evenings. Uh, and keep your projects aligned with your interests. Don't try and work on a project that you're no longer excited about. Uh, again, stick to things that you're excited about, embedded Raspberry Pi stuff or games or whatever. Always make sure that what you're working on is what you're excited about working on. So early steps for uh, getting an open source project out there. Obviously, the, the sticky and icky one is licensing. Uh, and here, of course, here's my disclaimer. I am not a lawyer, although I have to play lawyer ball with open source stuff all the time. It sucks, but it's the way it is. Uh, so hopefully I can, I can pass on some tips here that will make it a little easier for you, things I've learned over the years. Uh, so different criteria for the licenses that you choose for your project. How source is shared, how rights are assigned, um, what happens when you want to relicense -li re the code, whether you need to include attribution for all the changes, uh, auditing of the processes to keep it above board. Uh, and the, the, you know, there's a few ways that you can choose an open source license. This is a page from GitHub. Uh, choosing an OSS license doesn't need to be scary. Uh, and that's certainly true. Here they, they lay out three different options. Uh, the three options that they have, I want it simple and permissive, that's MIT. Uh, you know, basically just a step below throwing it out there as public domain. You can do anything with this code. Put it anywhere, make any changes, redistribute it any way you want. 
Uh, in the middle, I'm concerned about patents. There's a number of open source licenses out there that require con contributors to basically give a patent grant so that you can't have folks make contributions to a project and then turn around and patent it and, and sue you and everybody else that's using your project. Uh, the example here is Apache, which is one of my favorite licenses. Uh, the Eclipse public licenses and Mozilla public licenses are also have some patent language in them as well. Uh, and then I care about sharing improvements. You want to make sure, really make sure that any changes people make to your software ends up getting back into it. Uh, something like a GPL, a copyleft, where changes are, are required to be put back out there if you're going to release them. Uh, less and less popular these days because of what's called the viral nature of GPL. It tends to affect other libraries and packages around it, making them potentially need to be open sourced, uh, but still very popular for uh, really forcing open source, just ramming open source onto your users. Uh, I mentioned relicensing as a problem. Uh, we've had to relicense JRuby only once, thankfully, and that was to add the Eclipse public license, which is now our primary license. Uh, as your software changes over time, you may need to use a new license. You may want to add something that has patent language, like an EPL. Uh, my advice here is ideally get it right the first time. Pick a license that's going to cover every possible need that you're going to have in the future. Because relicensing usually means you have to go out there and contact every single person who's contributed to that project and make sure they're OK with this new license for their code. Uh, you can also kind of blunt this by having folks explicitly sign or opt into a contributor agreement. This does things like assigning the rights of your code to the project or to some foundation, uh, explicitly giving permission to relicense if it's necessary in the future. Uh, I, we don't have an explicit contributor ag agreement for JRuby, but we do have an implicit one. And from what I've found, generally just people publicly saying, yes, I agree to your licenses, yes, I agree that it's part of JRuby now, um, that's mostly what lawyers seem to be looking for. Uh, I talked about being respectful to your community. Uh, a lot of projects have started to adopt a code of conduct, uh, basically just spelling out what you expect of your community members, how you expect people to be treated, and, and how you expect people to treat each other, and then uh, explicitly saying what enforcement you're going to do, whether you're going to remove commits, remove commit bits, uh, take people off a mailing list, so on. Uh, just making it a little bit more clear that we're not going to tolerate jerks in our community. Uh, a good example of this, and this is one that's been adopted by lots of projects, contributorcovenant.org, contributor-covenant.org, uh, a nice little s form that you can just drop into your project. You'll have your own uh, code of conduct then. And so then you want to get your source out there. Uh, like I say, include that license from the first day it's out there. Uh, pretty much every project I put into, into open source or put up on GitHub now, within a couple days, someone asks me what the license is. So just have it there and available right away. Use services that are familiar to the community, like a GitHub and so on. Uh, always include readmes, build scripts, anything that someone's going to need to do, do your process of development. Uh, give them tips on how to get going, how to run tests. Uh, and then tell the world. Get on mailing lists and shout from the mountains that your project is out there and it's available, but don't necessarily expect that you're going to have a flood of people in there. Maybe it's going to be amazing. Maybe everyone is just going to start contributing to this project like mad, but generally it's, it's a slow process to get going. Um, and about using the, the tools of the community, I, I thought it's really exciting that Microsoft actually chose to put stuff on GitHub and they're not using their own source control areas anymore, their own project sites. They've recognized that the open source world generally is revolving around GitHub now. They, they, they're doing the right thing by putting it out there. Uh, some quick notes on encouraging contribution to your project. Uh, so the first thing that I recommend for any project that wants to encourage contribution is ask for it. Go out there and find people and say, hey, I need you to work on this. You're a crypto guy, and I hate crypto, but I love you, and I want you to work on my project. Uh, so simple. We get so many contributions just by asking for them. Uh, respond to emails. Be responsive when you uh, have bugs filed. Be responsive when people submit patches. Be active and be uh, somebody that they can count on getting a response from. Help educate contributing, uh, contributing members, help educate folks in the community, show them what you're doing, try and explain the process of development on the project. Uh, and be forgiving. Uh, understand that folks that are going to come into your project may not know how it works. They may be jerks themselves and have to learn how to unjerkify. Uh, 
they may be completely new to development. There may be folks that have not been doing this for too many years. So be forgiving, educate people, just be respectful, like you would want to be treated when you start out. And the final section here, just talking on releasing your software. Uh, some tips that we've learned over the years with JRuby. So here's a little checklist. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this. Uh, things like tagging should be obvious. There should be some sort of tag out there. Um, I mentioned release notes already. Uh, we, have, we now include uh, MD5, uh, SHA-1, and SHA-256. And by next year, someone's probably going to request some other hash that they want for our binary downloads. It's just this pervasive number of hashing things that people need to confirm that it's actually the real JRuby. Uh, securing download channels. This is one that uh, folks started requesting a couple of years ago. If you put it out there on, on a, a, a server, uh, you got a tarball or a binary or a jar file for someone to download a pre-made pre build, make sure it's HTTPS so that they can verify they're always getting it from the right place. Uh, and announce again according to community norms. Get on the right mailing list, tell people your project is out there and released. Um, so here's tagging. Uh, if you tag stuff on GitHub, you actually get a really nice release page that shows, that gives you a tarball download. You can attach release notes to that release as well. Um, there's probably some automated process that we're not using here to have our release notes in there. Um, again, using familiar sites, if you're doing a Java project, probably should have it out there in Maven Central at some point. Uh, it's not difficult to do. If you look up Maven open source, you'll find the Sonatype guide to getting projects out there, getting your own group ID. Really within about a day, you can be releasing stuff to Maven Central, and it's pretty trivial at that point. Um, and if you're in a, a particular root language community, uh, like Ruby, like Clojure, use the release mechanisms that they're familiar with as well. If you have your own project site for it, uh, make sure that the, the current release is prominently displayed. Don't make people hunt around for it. You'll get a better response uh, in bug reports. You'll be less likely that people are filing bugs against old versions. They can always go to the site and see what the current version is. Um, and we've actually got our little Travis badge up there to show that the build is green. And it was green this day, so that was good. Uh, I mentioned hashes before, also including release notes. Uh, there's a full JRuby download page that shows our two most current versions, uh, the JRuby 9.x and the JRuby 1.7x versions, uh, and then all of our different binaries that we have with their various sets of hashes. And I mentioned securing downloads, making sure everything's HTTPS. So a few final words here. The world really does run on open source, uh, and a large portion of the world runs on Java, which is open source. Uh, but open source stuff can't exist without people like you helping out and contributing and getting involved. I really would love, I'd love to encourage you all by the end of the week to have done something for an open source project you've never done before. File a bug if you haven't. Uh, submit a patch if you haven't. Get involved and try to help out projects that are there. Uh, because the bottom line is that you really are tomorrow's most important contributor to open source. You're the ones that's going to be doing the next project, open sourcing the next library. So. Get started today, and you'll have a much better tomorrow, and we all will. So thanks very much. And I think we have some time for questions, right? Yeah, sure, in front. Um, how much time do you spend on average a day uh, managing the community or creating the bugs? Or so the question was, how much time do I spend uh, on an average day managing the community and, and doing the non-code issues, non-technical stuff? Is that about right? Uh, so I, I work full-time on JRuby, which full-time means that from the time I get up to the time I go to sleep, I kind of am thinking about it. Uh, but I would say that for my particular role on JRuby, I spend as much as you know, 30 to 50% of my time just working with community. And that's things like answering questions on the mailing list, that's triaging bugs and, and helping move bug reports forward, uh, that is being on IRC and answering questions, and, m and making sure that other folks that are, that are working on JRuby can get their patches in or they know how to fix stuff. Uh, I, my role is a little bit more on that side than a typical open source person, but I'd say even folks in our community that are all technical and just writing code still deal with the community probably 10 to 20% of the day. Other questions? Yeah, over here.
That's a great idea. So the, the, the point was, uh, there are lots of companies, probably most companies out there using open source are not doing any work to contribute back to open source. Uh, maybe we should have an open source manifesto or an open source free trade badge of some kind. This, these would be great. Uh, I don't know if there's efforts to do something like this, uh, but even right now you can go out and find companies that say, here, this is an open source project that we help maintain. Uh, these are developers that we have out there. Uh, at conferences like this, uh, people that go and say, here's my company, I'm out here working on this project, you'll, you'll start to find the good companies in, uh, in, in the bad ones. Uh, I would love to see some sort of badging or some sort of, I don't know, it, it seems wrong to say it, but some sort of way to shame these companies into doing a bit more to help us out, rather than just, less, just us carry them along and never getting any benefits from it. I'd love to see that, definitely. Uh, any other questions? Got a couple more minutes here. Uh, yes, I see a hand there. It's going to be a bit of a shout. Okay, go for it. <laughs> uh, if you have, we are a company and we are considering open sourcing a big investment. Uh, the internet is pretty, um, there are not a lot of resources for making the business case to do something like that. You have the Red Hat business model where a lot of people say, well, that's one in a million shots. Nobody will make that. What do you recommend in terms of finding good uh, material for making a business case for open sourcing a big investment? Right. So the question is, how do you make that business case to a company that's, inter that's possibly considering open sourcing some closed source software uh, and get them, get them to do it, get them to see the reasons? Well, uh, some of the stuff that's in here, for example, getting more resources on the project uh, are a great way to show there's a potential for our, our users to actually contribute back to us. Uh, there are a number of similar checklists on some of the open source sites, Free Software Foundation and so on, that have lists of business cases for why you would open source software. Uh, and probably the, one of the biggest, biggest things that you would say to a company is the goodwill that they get out of it. They, you, they look so much better in the community and, and folks like Yirgen over here won't want to shame them because they're not making contributions. They will be one of the good guys. And I think every company wants to at least appear to be one of the good guys. Um, so those are, those are some tips and, and there's definitely stuff out there from other free software sites to help move that forward. Uh, and I think that's about it for us. So thanks again. <laughs>